now. All right, hang on a second. We are about to go live on YouTube. And once we are, when I see it pop up on the screen, I'll let us know it's ready to go. And thank you, Amaret, for my background. Everyone, this is what she did for me. Now, forevermore, every Zoom call I'm on, I get I have envy people just wanting it to so <laughs> your way. So all right, we are live on YouTube and we are ready to start. Great. It is 947 on this lovely day, Thursday, November 17th, 2022. And I would like to call to order, order the meeting of the building and operating committee. Before we begin though, please note this meeting is live stream on YouTube and recorded. Members of the public are encouraged to watch and listen to the meeting online or by dialing into 415-569-6446 for the audio of this meeting. If you would like to provide public comment at today's meeting, and if, you, and if you've not already done so, please do call 415-569-6446 and let the facilitator know what items you would like to speak on today. Madam Secretary, please begin by calling the roll. Thank you. I'll start with Director Cochran. Here. Director Conroy. Here. Director Hernandez is absent. Director Parr. Present. Director Rabbit? Here. Director Thier? Present. Vice Chair Mastin? Here. Chair Garbarino? Here. And President Curio? Here. Thank you. You have a quorum. And also on the line, you have, let me make sure, Directors Hill, Radoni, and Snyder. So you are also a Committee of the Whole. And on the line, we have Dennis Mulligan? Here. Joe Wire is absent. Eva Barr Furbush. Present. Thank you. Kim Manolius. Thank you. Dave Rivera. Good morning, present. Mona Babauta. Present. Jim Swindler is not here. Kelly Hopper. Present. Thank you. And also on the line, we have Mike Hoffman with us today. Here. Thank you. He will be doing a bulk of the presentation. So I'll turn it back over to you, Chair Garbarina. Thank you. I would like to remind everyone now to also mute their microphones until after staff's presentation and remember to unmute when we open up for director's discussion. If we have directors joining by phone, please use your mute button or star six to unmute yourself. After staff's presentation, I will be asking for any questions or comments on the item. Click on the raised hand function if you have questions or press star nine if joining by phone. If there are any questions, the secretary or I will call on you accordingly. If we missed your raised hand, please do speak up. After our discussion, we will ask for any public comment before moving on. Please follow along by referring to the page numbers located on the bottom right-hand corner of your meeting packet. We will begin with agenda item number three, which is to approve award of contract number 2022F072, on-call engineering, ship check, and on-site shipyard services. The re staff report begins on page three, and Michael Hoffman, our Director of Engineering and Maintenance, will present this item. Michael, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, members of the committee. The item before you today is an award of contract number 2022F072, on-call engineering, ship check, and on-site shipyard services to multiple firms for a total aggregate amount not to exceed $1,500,000 for a term of three years with two subsequent one-year options. The selected firms are Elliott Bay Design Group out of Seattle, Washington, Boston Naval Architecture and Marine Design of Seattle, Washington, Marine Systems Corporation of Boston, Massachusetts, Aurora Marine Design of San Diego, California, and Handy Marine Services of Seattle, Washington. On August 9th, 2022, the Golden Gate Bridge Highway and Transportation District issued a request for qualifications for on-call engineering, ship check, and on-site shipyard services to seek proposals from qualified firms to provide a wide array of marine engineering services and planning. Ferry Division staff looked back at historical projects and contracts that were awarded on an emergency or best interest basis and looked at potential future needs based on these past experiences, as well as California Air Resource Board admission requirements to develop a broad scope of services. The intent with this scope of services was to catch a wide net and attract a variety of different qualified firms that as a collective group satisfy the full scope of services. 
The district received five responsive proposals by September by the September 13th deadline, and an evaluation committee comprised of district staff reviewed and evaluated each proposal based on personnel's qualifications and experience, the firm's qualification and experience, and the overall approach to the scope of services. The evaluation committee determined that all five firms meet the RFQ requirements, are qualified to provide the services requested by the district, and have fair and reasonable rates based on past and current uh, contracts. These on-call contracts will provide Ferry Division staff with the necessary engineering support and resources to quickly respond to deficiencies found during regulatory hull exams by the U.S. Coast Guard, as well as conduct ship checks prior to drafting shipyard specifications, specifications and to inspect ferry vessels for additional work to be included in shipyard scope of services, among other projects. Ferry Division staff also requires engineering support services to assist the district in developing its plan for complying with the California Air Resource Board recently passed regulations on commercial hovercraft tailpipe emissions and feasibility studies for future alternative energy uh, propulsion methods and the Spalding Repower Project. Work will be assigned on a task order basis to the firm most qualified to perform the scope of work in the task order in accordance with FTA regulations. Staff, staff recommends the board approve award of these five contracts for on-call engineering, ship check, and on-site services to the selected for, firms for a total aggregate amount not to exceed $1,500,000. Thank you, and please let me know if I can answer any questions regarding this item. Michael, thank you for your presentation. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues at this time? Oh, Michael, good, and then Bert. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, you know, ship check would seem to be a, a self-evident term, um, but I don't want to stumble on a self-evident term, and I actually don't find a definition for it when I look on the web, let alone in the dictionary. So tell me what ship check is exactly. Sure. So prior to drafting a scope of services for a, a shipyard, um, a ship check would be having a firm come in, or we can do it ourselves, but having a firm come in and look at the vessel and go through it and double check our scope that we've already drafted to make sure that we didn't miss something. So getting that second set of eyes out here to basically do a, a survey, if you will, of the vessel. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay, Bert. Thank you, Michael. Uh, yeah, I just want to say how excited I am that we're moving this way in the direction because we're going to be seeing dynamic changes over the over the next decade, and and this is certainly the first approach. And I got to compliment you, Michael. It's a great job, and I'm really excited about this. Thank you, Director Hill. All good. Anyone else? Oh, Barb, there you are. Or no, that's my hand. I was wondering why your hand was <laughs> yellow, but white. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, don't have my, I don't have my hand up. <laughs> my hand's on your hand. Sorry, guys. I'm thinking about adopting a nine-year-old, and then I'll get this technology thing down. Um, good deal. Anybody else? It doesn't seem like it. Uh, that concludes our own discussion on item number three. But before we take our vote, is there anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item, Amaret? We have no speakers on this item. Great. Thank you. Colleagues, may I have a motion on agenda item number three to approve so or thank you. Second. Great. Thank you. Madam Secretary, please do a roll call vote. Thank you. We have a first and a second on item number three, starting with Director Arnold. Absent. Director Conroy. Aye. Director Garbarino. Aye. Director Judice. Abstain. Director Grosball. Is absent. Director Hernandez is absent. Director Meston. Aye. Director Parr. Aye. Director Rabbit. Aye. Director Radoni. Aye. Director Snyder. Aye. Director Stephanie is absent. Director Thier. Aye. Second Vice President Hill. Yes. First Vice President Cochran. Yes. And President Tirio. Yes. Thank you. You have 11 ayes and one abstention. And thank you for joining us, Director Giudice. Good. Thank you. And that, obviously that motion passes. We will now move on to agenda item number four, which is an informational presentation on ferry vessel electrification and alternative fuels. The presentation slides for this item begin on pages seven and go through page 24 in our packet. And Michael Hoffman will also be presenting on this item. Michael, go on ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning again. I'm excited for this opportunity today to share with you some of what staff has learned at recent conferences and trade shows 
and discuss a trip I took to Norway as part of a delegation to explore the country's electric and hydrogen fueled ferries. Just two weeks ago, ferry staff attended the Marine Log Ferries Conference, which was conveniently hosted here in San Francisco. The agenda was you know, really dominated by alternative fuels, including electrification. Um, in September, I accepted an invitation to be a panelist at a conference in Seattle, which was hosted by Elliott Bay Design Group. And the conference was called Go Green Beyond Battery. This particular conference was not so much focused on electrification, but some of the it was focused on the alternative fuel solutions that are both in use and in development. So the panel I was on discussed the changing regulatory landscape and how the operator is evolving, or I, I guess I should say um, adjusting to, to meet the or meet or exceed the regulatory demands. Um, I had an opportunity to discuss CARB's new amendments to the commercial hovercraft regulation and how they affect Golden Gate Ferry. It was an interesting conference made up of industry partners and operators, mostly from the West Coast, but also some um, East Coast and Gulf Coast operators. I bring this up because while well, you know we realize that California has some of the strictest tailpipe emission regulations nationwide, it isn't just California operators who are exploring alternative fuels and electrification. So what was the big takeaway? It was, you know, from these two conferences, it's, it was really that there's no silver bullet solution at this time. There are a few different alternative fuel options that have their own set of pros and cons. And in my opinion, the alternative fuels do it again. and or battery technology that will dominate the future will really depend on which solution best fits the operator's unique operating profile and which fuel, if any, dominates the market. Next slide, please. So earlier this year, I received an invitation from Innovation Norway to be part of a delegation to Norway to experience their technology in the electric and alternative fuel ferry space. I was fully aware that Norway is on the cutting edge of carbon neutral marine transportation, as well as you know, leading the charge on semi and full autonomous vehicles and vessels. But you know, who is Innovation Norway? Well, Innovation Norway is actually a state-owned development bank who seeks to promote Norwegian technology globally. So at this point, you know, I'm fairly interested in the delegation. Um, the invitation also included a rough itinerary, which included scheduled visits to multiple operators, industry partners, and regulators each day with a long bus ride or, or a short regional flight every evening. So in one week, the itinerary included stays in Oslo, Hagesund, Trondheim, and Bergen. So just, just by way of background, Norway is actually um, extremely active in the maritime industry. They're the world's second largest seafood exporter. And they also have the third most shoreline of any country uh, behind only Russia and China, excuse me, Russia and Canada. So the itinerary, appeared as though there were, you know, a lot, there was a lot of value in making this trip for me, but I was curious, you know, who else would be on the delegation? Next slide. So the, the delegation included public operators and policymakers from California, Washington State, Canada, and Alaska. Also invited were large, were a fairly large group of policymakers that included uh, members of California Air Resource Board and the California Energy Commission. So hearing this, I, hearing this, I felt strongly about joining this trip. Uh, to learn, you know, about the viable technology that's already in service and also be side by side with some of the policymakers who will be taking away from this delegation real experience to support future policy that will affect Golden Gate Ferry. Next slide. So before going to Norway, I had only ever really read about electrical vessels and in industry publications. And these publications usually tout what the vessel is capable of in theory, but that doesn't necessarily show how well a vessel performs in service. I had a couple different objectives to achieve in making this trip to Norway. First, first and foremost, I, I wanted to experience an electric boat. I drive an electric car. I would have thought that a crazy concept 10 years ago. I, I've worked in the maritime industry for over 20 years. And up until you know, that point, I had never been on board an electric or even a zero mission vessel of any type, uh, with the exception of a sailboat. I, I was also looking forward to speaking with battery manufacturers and other leading innovators in the hydrogen fuel space who could speak to the recent innovations and how they see zero emission technology evolving into the future. I had a couple secondary goals. I was hoping we, we would visit a zero emission ferry system that operated in a similar profile to that of Golden Gate Ferry. So I was hoping to find a ferry operator using zero emission technology that supported a high speed ferry run in excess of 30 knots with 400 or more passengers uh, with a trip that was about or greater than 11 miles um, with five minute dwell time or turnaround time between between runs. And and what and also I wanted to see what our operating profile would look like should we decide to adopt one of the current viable technologies that I experienced while there. So before we dive into some of the vessels, I hadn't I had an opportunity to see an experience. I, I'd like to talk briefly about hydrogen fuel 
and the supporting infrastructure required for electrification. I learned early on in this trip that there are different types of hydrogen fuels, and depending on how it's harvested or, or sourced, it's not necessarily carbon neutral. Next slide. So hydrogen fuel when burned is carbon neutral. The exhaust from hydrogen fuel cell boiler or internal combustion engine is basically steam or water vapor. So on the surface, it sounds like a great alternative fuel free of carbon emissions. However, the method of extracting hydrogen is not necessarily carbon neutral. So there are three different types of hydrogen uh, that we discussed on this trip, uh, blue, green, and gray. Gray can also be referred to as brown. Gray hydrogen is not in my opinion, a zero emission fuel. What we need to know about gray is it's produced using fossil fuels, methane, natural gas, or coal. The fossil fuel goes through a reforming process which rearranges the molecular structure of the fuel to yield hydrogen. Um, so for example, methane is, is CH4, and when, when it gets reformed, you separate the, the carbon from the hydrogen, um, and you're left over with, with carbon, which goes out to atmosphere. So uh, the hydrogen vehicle burning gray hydrogen, gray hydrogen only has steam in its tailpipe emission, but that's only because the carbon was released in the reforming or refining process. So depending on who you ask, a vehicle burning gray hydrogen is not a truly zero emission vessel. So how about blue hydrogen? Blue hydrogen is created using the same reforming method, but the carbon dioxide is not allowed to escape to the atmosphere. So the refinery, the refinery actually captures the CO2 and it stores it under pressure. Um, oftentimes they store it in underground vaults. So you can see how this isn't a perfect system. However, if we assume the CO2 stays captured indefinitely, it is a zero emission fuel. So obviously with this type, um, with this added you know, capture and storage process, it's going to, there's gonna be a bit of a price premium necessary for the manufacturer to cover the equipment and real estate necessary for the, the capture and storage of the carbon dioxide. Next slide. So finally, we have green hydrogen. In this refining system, hydrogen is generated using an electrolysis process that separates hydrogen from H2O water. This process uses a very high amount of energy to run the electrolysis, and to be truly zero emission, that power source for that energy needs to be zero emission as well. So in the case of this slide, it shows you know, wind turbines generating the electricity necessary to run the electrolysis. Oxygen is separated from hydrogen in the, in the electrolysis process, and that yields your, your hydrogen for your power. So in Norway, blue hydrogen is readily available. However, there, there were no sources of green hydrogen. We did have an opportunity to visit and tour a green hydrogen ferry. However, they trucked their hydrogen in from Germany. Uh, the green hydrogen is by far the most expensive source of hydrogen. Next slide. So once we have hydrogen, you know, how is it used? I, I chose to talk about this particular vessel because it uses the hydrogen in, in three different ways to generate power. So the, Hy the Hydra Stavanger is a double-ended passenger car ferry. This is a pilot project that was in the shipyard when we visited. So unfortunately, I, I didn't have an opportunity, opportunity to see this vessel in operation. Um, so the Hydra has a large battery bank and can run purely off electricity as one mode of operation. So the propellers are turned by an electric motor, which is powered by the stored energy in that battery bank. Next slide. In this slide, you can see the battery bank on the Hydra. The Hydra has two of these battery rooms and they're, they're identical and redundant. The second mode of operation is to run using hydrogen fuel cells. So in this process, they use hydrogen to generate electricity through a chemical reaction process. And, and the energy is stored in the battery bank to be used in the electric motors, which in turn move the propeller. The third and final method of propulsion using the hydrogen in this vessel was used is by using an internal combustion engine. Um, that internal combustion engine is uses hydrogen as its fuel source, but it does not generate electricity for the batteries. From the, in this case, it goes straight from the generator to the electric motors that drive the propeller. Next slide. So before we dive into purely electric vessels, let's discuss a little bit about the necessary charging infrastructure to support such a vessel. The electrical requirements for rapid charging a vessel are massive. Um, the particular rapid charger in this photo is a five megawatt charger, which is equivalent of 10,100 watt light bulbs. So to help kind of put that in perspective, you know, the fastest of Tesla superchargers we see throughout California run at 250 kilowatts, one fourth of a megawatt. So the power this charger can deliver is equal to 20 Tesla superchargers. So how fast, that's a big question, right? How fast can this charge, can it charge a vessel? And it's not really a simple answer. Using the electric vessel that we saw in the opening slide as an example, 
let's just say that battery was depleted to zero percent or a zero, near zero state of charge. We wanted to charge it all the way up to maximum. In theory, it would take 41 minutes to complete this charge cycle at five megawatts of power. However, the rate of charge is really dependent upon the temperature that individual battery cells and very much dependent upon the power balance amongst those cells. So what happens here is the power management system will restrict the charge rate to accommodate for, for temperature and also to ensure an even balance. And as it gets higher up towards, you know, 60% and up, the, the charge rate really does slow down as it, as it tries to even out that charge and make sure that all the battery cells come up evenly together. So anyhow, um, requiring this much power presents a few challenges, but there are some solutions. Next slide. So first and foremost, the power may not even be available from the public utility. And already that this was the case at many of their ferry locations. Um, when we look at our service, you know, the San Francisco ferry building is a very busy node where it's likely feasible and, and practical to pull the necessary power for rapid charging. However, our Sausalito, Tiburon, and certainly Angel Island locations would be much more challenging and could take many years necessary to get the actual power from the public utility, but there is a solution for this. Uh, and the Norwegian operators, they rely heavily on what's called microgridding. So a microgrid is the simple, in the simplest sense is, is like your own power plant. Next slide. So the simplest of microgrids for our purpose of charging a ferry vessel would include a load, which is the, the charger, a shore site battery bank, which is represented in the slide by the green energy storage module, and a connection to the utility. So where the utility doesn't have the power necessary to support rapid charging, a shore site battery bank can store energy saved from the public utility and rapidly deposit this energy through a charger and into the battery on the vessel. Once the ferry vessel rapid charging is complete, the shore site battery bank will slowly charge back up to its maximum capacity where it sits in standby until the next ferry requires charging. One of the nice things about these microgrids is, and you may notice on the slide, is they are scalable. So let's say we start with the very basics of a shore side battery, a grid connection, and the rapid charger for a ferry vessel. And in the future, we decide to build a, a parking structure and incorporate solar panels to supplement the microgrid. The slide kind of shows how that would work. So you, you can add that in in the future. You can also have a generator in the event that public utility is not available. The generator can provide power to the shore side battery bank. Okay, let's let's dive into a few examples of electric vessels. Um, next slide. So the following examples are going to be electric vessels that were were built and completed in the last couple of years. So this one here is the, the Riger Electrica. It's classified as an electric fast ferry. As you can see in the specifications, the ferry is capable of a maximum of 23 knots. However, the service speed for this vessel is 18 knots. The ferry can hold just shy of 300 passengers and has a range of 46 miles at its service speed of 18 knots. A couple of things to mention with respect to range and speed. The relationship between speed and range is not a linear function. It's really actually an exponential function. So when, while we don't have the data provided to us, it's safe to say that the jump to 23 knots would yield a significant, uh, significantly reduced range. Next slide, please. So here's another example of, a, of an electric fast ferry catamaran. This, this vessel, the Medstrom, operates at 23 knots, has a range of 15 miles, and can take 157 passengers. Next slide. Finally, the legacy of the fjords. You may remember this vessel from the very first slide in the presentation. Uh, this vessel is another catamaran and has a passenger count closer to what we have on board our high-speed catamarans. The legacy of the fjord carries a maximum of 400 passengers and has a 16 knot maximum speed with a 34 mile range. The recharge time for this vessel is 20 minutes. I had an opportunity to speak with one of the crew members of the legacy of the fjords and I, I asked him a few questions regarding the charging and the battery life. One thing he pointed out to me is, is something I'm familiar with being an electric car owner myself is that it's not recommended to fully charge the battery to 100% and it's also not recommended to fully deplete the battery uh, below or, or go below 20%. So the battery manufacturer recommended the crew on the legacy of the fjords maintain a state of charge between 20 and 80% wherever possible for the life uh, to, to improve the life cycle of the battery and its, and its overall health. So when we look at these range numbers, if we're, if we're handling the battery in optimum fashion, we are only use, utilizing 60% of its realized maximum range in order to stay between the 20 and 80% of its battery level. So the, the recharge time for the legacy of the fjords is 20 minutes for its specific operating profile which can vary depending on what battery level the vessel is at when charging commences. Next slide, please. 
So while in Norway, while in Norway, I was always trying to see how one of their electric fast ferries would operate in our service. So let's take a look at our high-speed fleet and their particulars. Our catamaran vessels carry between 400 and 500 passengers and have a service speed of 33 knots. The maximum speed varies, but it can get close to 40 knots. Our, our one-way trip from Larkspur to San Francisco is approximately 12, 12 miles, and our current schedule has us at the dock for five minutes before departing on the next trip. So we have a few gaps here with regard to electric high-speed vessel technology. Our turnaround time does not provide enough time for charging. This could be addressed by schedule changes potentially. The more, the more glaring issue is, is, with, is with the service speed. Our service speed of 33 knots is, is necessary to alleviate congestion on the Highway 101 corridor by delivering our customer from Larkspur to San Francisco in 30 minutes. So, so why don't we see electric high-speed ferries in excess of 30 knots um, that can carry passengers over, over 400 people? Really, it all comes down to weight. Next slide. There, there's a significant weight penalty with batteries compared to fossil fuels. The lithium ion battery is roughly 50 times heavier for the same amount of energy output when compared to diesel fuel. This is referred to as energy or power density. In the last 10 years, the good news is, you know, the last 10 years, power density in lithium ion batteries has improved by 50%, which is, you know, significant. However, that, that trend is starting to plateau a little bit. Um, compressed hydrogen fuel is about seven times heavier per, per unit energy than its diesel counterpart. Mm -hmm. And as a result, could be a future alternative fuel solution for high-speed catamaran ferries. Alternatively, we've actually spoken to a few different um, engine manufacturers as well as vessel designers who feel methanol will be the fuel of the future for high-speed catamaran vessels. The power density of methanol is, is half that of diesel. So the weight of fuel you would need to carry is only twice that of the weight of diesel that you currently carry. Methanol, however, is not completely carbon neutral, but it comes very close. Compared to conventional fuse, methanol cuts carbon dioxide by approximately 95%, reduces nitrogen oxide by 80%, and it completely eliminates particulate matter and sulfide, uh, sulfur oxide emissions. I've spoken to two different engine manufacturers who are in the R&D phase of methanol internal combustion engines. So we'll need to wait and see which fuel is the best option as technology evolves in the coming years. Next slide, please. So, so after talking about the high-speed vessels and the weight penalty challenges we experience, how about the Spalding class boats? Our Spalding vessels have 20, have a service speed of roughly 20 knots and they can carry 700, over 700 passengers. The, the slide says 12 miles for one-way trip. However, you know, these vessels operate mostly in the Sausalito, Tiburon, and Angel Island service. And these runs are approximately six miles. Based on the technology that I experienced firsthand in Norway, future electrification, alternative fuel, or hybrid possibilities for these vessels is right around the corner. I'm looking forward to hearing what the outcome is of some of these pilot projects, such as the Ryger Electrica vessel we saw in slide seven, to help guide our decision-making process with respect to alternative fuels and electrification in the Spalding class boats. So district staff will be also looking into our terminal replacement projects to ensure that, that we future-proof as best as possible our terminal design to accept uh, microgridding technologies. Next slide, please. So it's, it's really an exciting time in the small passenger vessel industry. There, there are a handful of different technologies. You know, those, those, um, those conferences I went to, it was, they just completely dominated the, the agendas. Um, so which zero emission technology best fits Golden Gate Ferry's operating profile is still to be determined, but it is safe to say that it's a question of when not if Golden Gate Ferry will make a transition to zero emission technology. So thank you all for giving me the time to present today. And uh, if time does permit, I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Michael, wow. Thanks again uh, for this presentation. It was phenomenal and fascinating, truly. Um, I'm, uh, I'm amazed, but I shouldn't be amazed uh, at the breadth of your information, your knowledge, and your ability to report it. So thank you so much. This is very exciting. You're so welcome. my colleagues, oh, good, all good. Uh, are there any questions or comments for Michael? And I see Bert's hand up. Go ahead, Bert. I could probably spend an hour with questions. <laughs> I'd like to, I, I want to hear the recording because you really talk a little bit faster than I can follow it perfectly. So I've, oh, the nice recording is going to be really particularly important. But just one, one thing I just wanted to ask, <laughs> the charging stations that I've seen um, in Norway, I've been looking at them for the last few years, are, are quite large and massive, you know, for the ferry. Um, just to ask realistically, do you think it's going to be a, a real tr trouble to get something like that at, say, Sausalito, for instance, 
um, you know, and, and with uh, BCDC and all the other things. Is that, is that, that's the thing that I think could take the most time to be able to, um, even though it's not the most technically <laughs> challenging. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I'm sure there will be challenges there, um, but you know that the trade-off is you have a zero emission ferry vessel. So I mean, politically that's gotta be quite popular. The reason they're so large, and I, I didn't mention it in the presentation is because they're fully automated. So you have to start charging as soon as you get in because time is of the essence. You want to get as much electricity in the boat as you can during that short time. Um, and you would, it would require probably two, at least two crew members to, to do this process. So the crew can focus on what's really important. That's the safety of the passengers embarking and disembarking while this charging process happens um, autonomously. And, and that's part of the reason they are so big. They, they could be made potentially smaller, but then again, it would require additional crew uh, to do that process. Yeah, I'm concerned with the lead time to it. You know, the technology could probably be around faster than the lead time, but that's something I'd like to see studied and, and kind of a report to it as we're doing our strategic planning. Great, anyone And I'll else? wait for the recording for, for more questions. Me too. Um, anyone else? Okay, Almorad, is there anyone from the public that wishes to address us on this item? We do. We have two speakers today on this item. The first one we have is David Pilpel. David Pilpel, go ahead. Uh, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine. Thank you. Uh, great presentation. Very interesting stuff. A uh, couple of thoughts. Um, while electric uh, vehicles, including uh, electric-based ferries, I, I don't know what the best term is, um, may have direct air quality benefits, the energy generation and distribution still have uh, impacts. Um, in my view, batteries and cables require metal, metals and minerals, including lithium and nickel, uh, that have their own um, impacts, environmental, social, geopolitical, et cetera. Um, I am just thinking a bit out loud, but perhaps having two different technologies provides uh, or would provide enough um, benefits while diversifying um, the fuel options. So um, the district would not be locked into uh, one technology with um, its issues and, and not having access to another. Um, I would also uh, think that examining purchasing policies to prioritize um, product uh, recycling and considering uh, disposal uh, options might be useful. I think we've become a bit of a, or very much of a throwaway society. And so we purchase things in some cases that are composites or things that cannot easily be uh, broken apart and recycled. And that just creates a lot of uh, waste. And I, I think that there are a, a lot of uh, direct, uh, indirect and cumulative wastes that are uh, generated with um, energy um, production distribution. Uh, transmission, et, et cetera. So I'm just uh, looking at it from uh, that point of view. Uh, nothing uh, against ferries and good propulsion. Ferries are good, propulsion is good. Um, so anyway, those are just some thoughts. Uh, thanks again to um, staff for the enlightening presentation. Thanks. All right, thank you, David. Uh, the next we have is Dave Brody. Dave Brody, are you with us still? Yeah, good morning, board members, managers, and staff. Uh, my name is Dave Brody. I work with the Climate Reality Project. Uh, thank you, Michael Hoffman, for your excellent overview on electric ferries, but I'd love to have joined you in Norway when my, when my grandparents immigrated from years ago. <laughs> um, and not just because of the ferries, but my thanks as well to Dennis Mulligan and Amaret Kowong for giving me a heads up on today's presentation. I'm glad I didn't miss it. A few comments I'd like to add. Please note that any consideration of blue hydrogen is a major wrong turn. It's not about CO2 emissions. It's about the methane it's made from. As described, it is made from methane, which is a greenhouse gas 20 times more potent than CO2. It always leaks into the atmosphere and in its extraction and refinement. The BP logo in the corner of that slide is a dead giveaway that this is, in fact, a petroleum product. Green hydrogen, on the other hand, which is refined by electrolysis, is a clean energy option. And I understand that the problem with the amount of energy needed in the process is expected to be resolved in the near future. 
Uh, I was very happy to see that the presentation included electrification and supporting infrastructure, and I'm even happier to see, uh, looking ahead to tomorrow's board meeting and Mr. Mulligan's report, that the district is committed to working with the MTC committee to study the needs and process for multiple transit agencies' cooperation in developing a shared charging station infrastructure for electrification of uh, public transit. And as for the look at clean energy microgrid, I urge the district to look ahead at that option. I participated in a, a webinar with CARB and the California Energy Commission earlier this year and heard a very explicit statement that organizations transitioning to vehicle electrification need to look at bringing their own clean energy to the table as part of the plan. Finally, I would like to add uh, one of my own discoveries uh, recently in searching uh, for the latest in electric ferries. Artemis Technology of Belfast uh, is now producing the EF24 electric uh, passenger ferry with a top speed of 38 knots it, uh, with a capacity of 150 passengers. The EF24 flies over the water on hydrofoils, making it a very smooth ride. I hope to live long enough to see a larger version, one that meets the bridge district needs, flying over the waters of San Francisco Bay someday. Thank you all for investing your time and energy into plans for a zero emissions future. And thank you again for the great presentation. Great. Thank you, David. Thank you, Mr. Rohde. And thank you, Amaret. Um, I'm assuming there's no one else that wishes to speak on this item. Uh, in which case, I thank you again, Michael. This was inspirational. Thank you for all of that effort. I've been on trips like that to look at different technologies. And um, what comes to mind is this is Tuesday, it must be Belgium, that old movie where it's like a, a bit of time in each spot and you're just a sponge trying to take it all in and you did a great job, thanks. Um, no action is required on this informational presentation, um, which was phenomenal, again. Uh, we'll move on then to item number five on the agenda, which is an informational monthly report from board appointees on the Smart Transit Board. And I will kick it off, but am anxious to hear also from my colleagues, Barbara and David. Um, there were two meetings of the Smart Board since we met last, the first one of which was November 2nd. And some of the highlights were um, CARB information about proposed uh, regulation changes for in-use locomotives, um, the conversation generated around uh, or circulated around availability of that technology cost and the potential performance. We all now know that Governor Newsom is lifting the state of emergency and that that will end at the end of February in terms of our um, meetings in this format. Ridership, I was uh, happy to report, uh, and so was uh, Eddie, our GM, uh, that in October, 56,576 passengers were carried safely on the smart train, 99% over the prior year. Um, marketing, there was actually a Halloween social media campaign, which was very successful. Uh, the pathway open, opener was also very successful, the multi-use pathway opener on October 22nd in Petaluma. And I know Barbara and David were there, um, very much enjoyed by families, uh, elected officials, and several board members. At that meeting, we also had a presentation by Heather McKillop, our CFO, on a fiscal year 2022 budget to actual comparison. Then on to the board meeting yesterday of November 16th, we heard uh, again on the emergency item that we had heard about on the second about the Brazos Branch Bridge um, need for emergency repairs because it had failed. And the phenomenal part of this report is that the staff at SMART was um, able to repair due to um, their own ingenuity and technology a fix that was able to take trains onto trucks and back again in the space where the repairs were taking place um, without customer interruption at all. And it all took place in one week's time. Um, the ridership in October was down a bit, about 9%. Um, 
uh, over the 2021 ridership. Not sure why that is. Uh, it could be the rain, but they don't think so because it's continuing. So the staff is investigating that. There's also a toy drive on, on December 3rd. So if you have the opportunity, please do <coughs> join us and the staff and bring an unwrapped uh, toy. Um, and you get a free ride on SMART. Um, also wonderful employee promotions with Marcus, Steve and Carlos all being promoted within. So that's my report and I'm happy to ask my colleagues if I did okay and it's okay to say no and uh, if they have anything to add. You did great, Patty. Thank you very much. I'm always amazed she makes it uh, like we were almost there. I will say that yesterday we had what we thought might be a little bit premature, but not really, uh, discussion about where to go after the COVID, um, the COVID um, restrictions lift in, in February. We discussed whether or not um, we should diminish the number of meetings, whether or not it would be possible um, to have a part Zoom and part, uh, and part live. And we know that uh, Kim, Manolius had sent us something from Hanson Bridget that said it's pretty straight and dry, cut and dried, but it was pointed out that the state meetings um, will continue to be the boards in, in residence and people being able to zoom in. So we're not sure uh, what's going to happen on that, but stay tuned. It was, uh, it was interesting to me that the, that the items, um, that the board members brought up to make sure that we were still in touch with the organization mirrored what we do with the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, for instance, that Dennis has a fairly robust emergency authority uh, to sign contracts without coming to the board, but then he reports regularly um, what those um, emergency signings were. So the the Golden Gate Bridge, of course, is much, much older in its organization. So I think that SMART will be looking to some of those parameters as we move forward and maybe don't have two meetings a month, maybe only have one. So that's all. All good. Thank you, David. With your cold, I won't ask you to join in unless you have something that you really, really, really want to add. <laughs> you poor thing. Okay, it was, it was a very good meeting, Barb, you're absolutely right. All of us are going to be wondering about, um, also there was hope that there was environmental benefit to meeting via Zoom as opposed to uh, moving around a lot. All of you travel a great distance to go to your meetings. So all of that came into consideration as well. Do any of my colleagues on the board have any questions or comments about the SMART report? Seeing none. Uh, that concludes discussion on item number five. But before we move on, Amoret, is there anyone from the public that wants to address us on this item? We have no speakers on this item. Okay. Uh, no action is required for item number five. So we'll continue on to item number six, the status report on engineering projects beginning on page 27 of our packet. And Ava will present her report. Ava, please proceed with your informational report. Chair Garbarino, members of the committee, my written report is before you and I'll be happy to answer questions uh, you might have for me. Wonderful. Colleagues, I see Jim, you've got your hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> first, I'd like to thank Ava for uh, highlighting the portions of her report that have changed since the previous month. It makes it much easier to read. And I've been meaning to thank her for that for quite a while. Um, my question, on page 48, um, were any of the DTSC comments of a critical nature? All right. Um, <coughs> not, not really. I mean, um, we are modifying the report to satisfy the comments we received. Okay. Um, and then on... Uh, page 56, has the elevator replacement work created any workplace disruption or been cause for concern, um, noise, vibrations, dust, et cetera, that might be affecting our staff? 
Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, what we did during the most noisy and uh, disruptive type of operations, contractor work at night. So oh. this minimize an impact on people who uh, were present in the office during daytime. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else? No. Great report again, Ava. Thank you so much. You. Um, great. No action on item number six. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? So let me talk to you. We have no speakers for this item, and we have okay. no other speakers under public comment. As well. Wonderful. Okay. Then I will move us on to thank you. And we've reached the end of our agenda, if I'm not mistaken. And may I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? So moved. Second. Great. I hear no or see no objections. So that concludes the meeting of the Building and Operating Committee meeting. Thank you so much, colleagues. Yeah. The time is now 1032. Mm -hmm.